Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the for episode 12 in the Gleebel webinar series. I know that for many of you, the time of this webinar is not very convenient given your time zone. It's either very late in the evening or early in the morning. So I want to especially thank those of you that are staying up late or getting up very early to be with us today. If you are joining live, I commend your dedication and thank you for being here. Next week, we're excited to welcome Professor Damien Fabergé from Insa Lyon in France. Damien has been using the Glebo for about 20 years and he and his team have done some really innovative work using this system. Damien will share some of his experiences and research with the Glebo, including a couple of case studies, one on the thermomechanical process to develop a new bainitic steel, as well as an example of recrystallization steels using a max strain mobile conversion unit. We'll have a link up link on our website shortly to register for that webinar. As we mentioned last week, today's webinar will follow a much different format than our past sessions. In previous sessions, we included time for Q&A at the end of our presentations. However, sometimes we just get so excited about thermomechanical physical simulation that we lose track of time and we don't get to address many questions during the webinars. So today's session will focus on popular questions received during the webinars, as well as common questions that our technical team frequently receives. We have a long list of questions that we are planning on reviewing today. However, please do feel free to enter additional questions into the chat tool here in the webinar. We have a couple of team members available to address these questions via text chat. I don't think we'll have time to answer new questions live in today's webinar. However, if we don't get to them, we can add them to a list to address in a future FAQ style webinar. I've mentioned this in the last few webinars. Uh, please do sign up for the customer support portal. If you are a Glebal user, you can search the knowledge base and create support tickets. You can also access, uh, oh, you can access the portal on our website. If you click on resources, uh, the resources tab, you can get started there. Our agenda today is quite simple. We've selected a handful of questions and we'll have our team discuss each topic. There is no real central theme to the questions, so the topics will bounce around a bit, but we think the content will be useful. And I have brought in several colleagues here at DSI to help address your questions. Introductions here. Uh, I've seen uh, Daniel Quigley. I've uh, been the um, director of business development here at DSI, and my new role here apparently is the uh, webinar host. So I've updated my title at least temporarily. Also, I have Dr. Brian Allen. He's DSI's chief metallurgist. Uh, Dr. Wayne Chen. Uh, he's metallurgist here at DSI, uh, longtime Weeble user and head of China operations. Uh, we also have Fulvio Siciliano. Uh, if you've been on some of our previous webinars, uh, you saw Fulvio's examples of extrusion and rolling using his family's pasta recipe. Uh, so I've at least temporarily updated his title here as well. Uh, and also David Jake Jacon, who has uh, been at DSI, I think, forever. Uh, he's done almost every role here at DSI. Uh, he's currently the aftermarket parts and service manager and is often the, kind of the first person you'll talk to if you, you call up for some, some support or service. Uh, so Jake is a resource and he's here to help us uh, answer some questions as well. But I'll start uh, a couple of easy questions to begin with. Uh, does DSI support older equipment, including the Glebo 1500? Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, we always will support our equipment. Uh, there is a caveat here though. Uh, a lot of those machines were installed, uh, 1500 was introduced in 1979. Uh, we sold a lot of 1500s in the 1980s. So uh, finding parts can be a challenge, finding people to that have the expertise on those systems. Uh, we still have them here, but it is a challenge. So uh, we can support them. Uh, we always can't guarantee uh, results, but if you do rely on a 1500, uh, and the machine is quite old, uh, I do recommend starting to budget for a, a replacement system. Uh, we can, we do have a, kind of a trade-in program where we'll, we'll bring in uh, older 1500s uh, and give kind of discounts on new systems to get them out of service because uh, we know they, they can be difficult to service. Can the 1500D measure nil strength temperature, NST, or DRT and DTR? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, however, you will need some apparatus or equipment that probably came with the machine when you originally purchased it. So if you're still running at 1500, chances are you're taking very good care of it and you probably still have that equipment handy. Uh, if you don't, uh, I would reach out to Jake. Uh, we probably don't have, we probably can't sell a new new apparatus, um, but uh, the machine is capable of doing that. Can 1500 be upgraded with the GTC console? 
Uh, unfortunately, you can't. It, the system is is quite old. Uh, but I would again recommend the the 500 series, the 563, or the 540, or the 3180. Um, very capable machines that really do a lot of the similar types of testing that the, the 1500 uh, was known for. This next question: uh, It's uh, when using Joule heating, is it possible to perform compression tests at high temperatures to determine the adiabatic heating of the sample by avoiding cooling or heating? Of the sample during deformation, and actually, there's a couple of questions here on adiabatic heating, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Brian Allen to address them. Here, Brian, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Dan. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yeah, there are a couple of questions about adiabatic heating. So, just uh, touching briefly, adiabatic heating, of course, is just the heat generated internally in a sample from the work of deformation that is done, uh, you know, under a tensile torsion compression stress. So. This question, I believe, is asking if the Glebal can actually measure how much adiabatic heating is happening in the sample. Uh, the answer to that is 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 yes, but not probably with a, a, an ability to get a perfect number of, of joules per gram or a, a, a number like that. But uh, there's a couple ways you can look at the amount of adiabatic heating that's happening in a sample. One of the ways is simply by looking at the power angle, or if your machine has a thermal power control, looking at the uh, the uh, the amount of heat that's flowing into the sample. So as you compress or or deform the sample, that sample will generate internal heat. If you have the Glebal set for a constant temperature, the thermal system of the Glebal will react to that heat being generated in the sample by reducing the power input going into the sample. So you can see that adiabatic heating as a reduction in the power angle or the power going into the sample. Uh, another way to possibly look at this and get a, a sort of a semi-quantitative measure would be to heat your sample using a constant power angle control. So using the power angle variable and and maybe doing some experiments and figuring out what power angle gives you the constant temperature you're looking for, then the deformation under that constant power angle will result in a heat rise in the sample, seeing the adiabatic heating, and you may be able to then calculate uh, a measure of adiabatic heating based on, on that heat rise using the, the size of your sample and the specific heat capacity of your sample. So there are a couple ways to look at this. Uh, I will say, you know, neither of them are absolutely perfect, but it is something that's possible to do. So uh, next slide, Dan, please. Okay, I think this is another question that's uh, basically asking how to essentially get around the problem of the heat rise that, that may occur during adiabatic heating. Uh, I may be misinterpreting this question, but uh, if so, please uh, just uh, ask another question on the on the forum and we'll try to get, get back to you with the answer to that. But uh, uh, the Glebal will measure the level of adiabatic heating that happens in a sample, depending on how fast the deformation is and how much the sample deforms, the thermal control system is going to be actually quite good at, at, at reacting and reducing the power input to the sample so you don't get any excessive rise in the sample from adiabatic heating. If your deformation results in so much adiabatic heating that, that the complete shutoff of the power still cannot prevent the temperature rise in the sample, then, you know, um, unfortunately, it's going to be unavoidable that you see a temperature rise in the sample. So in that case, I would say that you need to understand that that temperature in the sample is rising a little bit above your program temperature due to adiabatic heating, and you will just have to use those calculations uh, as you, uh, you know, create the equations or the graphs that you're using that data for. So just be aware of the adiabatic heating does occur. The thermal system can usually compensate for it, but if the move is large enough, it might not be able to, and then you'll just have to use the actual sample temperature in your data analysis instead of the program sample temperature, because they might be slightly different due to adiabatic heating. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yep. So the next slide, uh, actually, there was a, a number of questions, uh, I guess, throughout the number of webinars, talking about thermal gradients. So I asked Brian just to put together a couple of slides that kind of just talk about thermal gradients in general, the different types of ways that we look at it, and you need to kind of account for thermal gradients in the Glebal. Okay, yeah, thermal gradients is a is a pretty complex topic in the Glebal, so I'll take a, a few minutes and a few slides. Uh, I'll touch on this topic. I probably won't be able to get, you know, everyone's questions answered in the, the short time that I have available, but uh, in the Glebal, the thermal gradient is, uh, it's actually a design feature of the Glebal. The initial Glebal was designed to do heat-affected zone 
testing and simulation where a thermal gradient is is exactly what you want. Uh, some kinds of testing you want a high thermal gradient, some kinds of testing you want a low thermal gradient, and with different grips available in the Gleeble, you can control the thermal gradient. So it is a, a fairly tailorable system, uh, but there are some things you have to understand. One of the first things you need to understand is that it, there are a lot of factors that go into controlling the thermal gradient in a Gleeble sample. The first, of course, is sample geometry. You know, is it a compression? Is it a tension sample? Six millimeter, 10 millimeter, uh, plain strain? All those will affect the, the thermal gradient in the sample. Uh, the material obviously will affect the thermal gradient because uh, the material will affect both the electrical and the uh, thermal resistivity of the material, which have big uh, components in the thermal gradient. Uh, the free span that you use, the atmosphere that you use in a Gleeble, is it in a vacuum, is it in a, a inert gas, is it air, that will have a big role in the thermal gradient as well. Obviously, the grips and anvil material, the heating rate, the hold time, and the, if you use any external insulation on the sample. So I have a couple of graphs here, Dan, if you go to the next slide, that discuss the thermal gradial. Uh, the first thing we'll talk about is the axial thermal gradial. So this is the, the, the as you're looking at the sample here, the left and right thermal gradient in a Gleeble sample. Now this shows a Gleeble tension sample uh, and it shows two different kinds of grip. So this illustrates how we control that axial thermal gradient. So the top picture there you see has a very steep thermal gradient and this would correlate to the uh, the full contact copper grips or the, or the bottom graph on the thermal gradient, uh, uh, the bottom line, excuse me, on the thermal gradient graph to the right. So by using full contact copper grips, we're able to extract a lot of heat out of that sample from both sample ends where they're clamped into the, the water-cooled grips. And that allows us to deliberately generate a very high axial thermal gradient in the sample. Now note we still, in the crosswise direction, have a isothermal plane in the diametral direction of the sample, but we have a very significant axial thermal gradient. The sample below shows our partial contact stainless steel grips. Now these grips extract significantly less heat from the sample, so we get a, a, essentially a uniform left and right thermal gradient, uniform axial thermal gradient. There is a, a little bit of thermal gradient there, but you know we can get this thermal gradient down to you know uh, probably not much more than one C per millimeter with the right setup in the Gleeble. So uh, you, basically the takeaway from this slide is that is that the thermal gradient is there but it is controllable, it is tailorable, and depending on what your uh, experimental needs are, we can probably uh, you know, get the thermal gradient that you need. Uh, one other thing to think about is that there are trade-offs when you're talking about thermal gradient. The full contact copper grips have very good electrical conductivity and electrical connection to the sample, so we can heat very fast in those grips. The partial contact stainless steel grips don't have as much connectivity to the sample, so we are a little bit more limited in the heating rate with those types of grips. So uh, as with everything in life, there are there are some trade-offs that, that you have to think about. Uh, next slide, Dan. This is the radial thermal gradient. So what this graph shows is the temperature difference from the surface of a round tensile bar specimen to the center of that specimen. So what we did was we cut a slot in the specimen, we put a thermocouple in the center of the specimen, another on the surface in order to get that thermal gradient here. So uh, one thing I should have mentioned in the earlier slide and I'll mention this slide is these are steady state thermal gradients. So uh, we'll talk about the, the development of the thermal gradient over time in a little bit, but uh, these are all assuming that you've held that sample for you know 10 or 30 seconds long enough to achieve a, a steady state thermal equilibrium system. So what these graphs show is that uh, we can, depending on what the setup and atmosphere is, have a, a, a reasonably high surface to center thermal gradient. So obviously in a helium atmosphere, helium, as we know from quenching, is a, is a very good heat conductor. It can conduct a lot of heat off the surface of the sample. So that good uh, heat conduction off the surface of the sample will give a higher surface to center thermal gradient with a helium atmosphere as compared to, say, a, a, a carbon uh, argon atmosphere with carbon steel uh, is the second graph below. Uh, the other thing to notice is, is obvious, I think, is that as the temperature gets higher, that thermal gradient gets larger. Then moving down to the to the third uh, third line on the graph, we see that uh, carbon steel and vacuum has a, a fairly good thermal gradient surface to center, not a whole lot of uh, variation from surface to center. Uh, the same atmosphere in stainless steel has a little bit less just due to the difference of conductivity of the stainless steel. Uh, 
And then finally at the bottom, this is a sample that's been wrapped with a flexible thermal sleeve. This is a very similar thermal sleeve as you would use in the, the ISO T setup. So what this does is it uh, insulates that surface so the surface is not losing a lot of radiation. And we can get you know what is essentially a thermal gradient that's it's essentially zero within the, the range of the accuracy of the thermal couples. So again, you know, depending on your your uh, material, your setup, we can tailor that radial thermal gradient from, from something you know that's not too bad to something that's almost zero. Next slide, please. This is a sample uh, video that I just put in here to show the effect of time on thermal gradients. So we all understand how the Glebe works and that it heats with joule heating. Now, joule heating is going to heat the sample uniformly uh, over the entire bulk of the sample. So the ends are going to heat at the same rate as the center. However, the heat extraction is going to be a time-dependent phenomenon, so the heat will start to uh, soak out of the ends into the water-cooled grips. So one thing you have to understand with thermal gradient is that it's not just dependent on geometry and material, it's also dependent on time. So Dan, if you can run that again. So you'll notice here the initial heating starts, the ends of the bar are very hot, the temperature is being controlled by the thermal couple in the center, and as we heat at a very fast rate, the entire bar heats up. Then as we reduce the heat to maintain a constant temperature, those ends start to cool off. So you have to be aware of that as you're planning your experiments, that you may need a, a few seconds hold time at peak temperature to let that sample equalize and let that thermal gradient uh, stabilize before you, you continue on with your experiment. Okay, we've got a couple slides here now on induction heating. Uh, we did introduce induction heating uh, uh, several years ago and, and have sold several systems uh, that, that customers are working with right now. Uh, the question was, you know, is, is induction heating better or direct resistance heating better? Now, of course, that's a very open-ended question. I'll try to move through it pretty quickly, but the, the answer is that it depends. Uh, direct resistance heating was chosen for the initial design of the Glebe for many very valid reasons primarily because it is a very fast heating method. We can heat faster than any other heating method. And two, it is a bulk heating method, so we can heat the center of the sample at the same speed as the surface of the sample. That means we can heat very fast without getting uh, in, you know, high axial thermal gradients. This is very useful for things like dilatometry, where a surface center thermal gradient is uh, makes dilatometry difficult because you're looking at different phase transformations happening in the in the sample at different times. So direct resistance heating is is certainly much better for very many kinds of of applications, but direct resistance heating does have some limitations, like everything in life. So one of the limitations of direct resistance heating is that we have to use conductive anvils. So the anvils have to conduct heat or excuse me, have to conduct electricity into the Glebe sample. Well, most things that have good electrical conductivity also have good thermal conductivity. That means that where that anvil contacts the sample, we may get a, a slight cold spot or we may get a, a thermal gradient, just like I just talked about. So induction heating lets us move to different anvil materials that are less thermally conductive, such as quartz. Uh, quartz is a very insulated material, so using quartz anvils with an induction heating system, we can actually get a very, very nice thermal gradient in a sample, uh, almost zero, because the quartz anvils are not conducting much heat out of that sample. Uh, quartz does have some limitations on temperature and strength, so we also have silicon nitride anvils available. They are not quite as thermally insulating as the quartz, but they are much more thermally insulating than the, the carbide or the stainless steel material we use for other anvils. So uh, that's one of the big impacts that we can use. The other issue with uh, with uh, induction is that it lets us do things like look at different lubricants. So since we don't have to have a lubricant that conducts electricity, we can do experiments with different lubricants with the induction heating, which we would not be able to do with uh, direct resistance heating. Next slide, Dan. So this couple slides I'm going to breeze through real quickly. These just kind of show the induction heating system for those of you that may not be familiar with it. So it does just mount to the back of the Glebe. Uh, next slide, please. It can uh, be mounted on any Glebe 35, 3800, and we do have a variety of different standard coils that are available for different uh, sample sizes and geometries, but you will need a different coil for each specific uh, sample family. Maybe not necessarily each specific geometry, but each different type of sample does require its own individual coils. Next slide, please. 
So again, uh, heating and cooling rates depend on the sample size and material. I will say in general, the, the uh, induction heater is a much less powerful system than the direct resistance heater. So you will have uh, probably slower heating rates and also probably slower cooling rates if you're doing natural cooling because again, of the insulative type anvils that I discussed earlier. Uh, the temperature measurement, the power, the cooling water all comes directly from the Glebal system. So there are no, uh, no extra hookups there that are required. So uh, the final bullet there is that the, the induction system does require a Glebal touch control console. So if you have an older Glebal that doesn't have the GTC, you will have to upgrade to a GTC in order to install induction heating on your system. Uh, what frequency does the coil operate at? The system that we use operates between 50 and 150 kilohertz, although it is a, a, an automatic system and it does have a, a internal tuning system that automatically selects the most efficient frequency for your sample. So that basically happens automatically and the user doesn't really have to worry about that. Uh, the temperature range is a good question. It's a little bit dependent on sample type and geometry. The induction coils themselves are water cooled, so they will, will stay cool even at very high sample temperatures. The, the Really the only limit on sample temperature with the induction heating system is going to be the power of the induction heating system itself and the coupling efficiency of that uh, induction heater to the sample. Uh, and then the internal tank temperatures. So one of the things you'll have to look at if you're trying to do very high temperature testing inside of Glebal is that there are some limits in how hot the inside of the tank can be allowed to get before uh, things like the, the, the thermocouple cold junction sensor starts to saturate or, or you get to the point where you can actually damage some of the seals in the Glebal or the tank itself becomes too hot to touch and becomes an operator safety issue. Uh, last question here is about induction heater and the hydro wedge. Uh, yes, the induction heater can be used with the hydro wedge. Uh, can you water quench afterwards? Yes, you can, but the coil will interfere slightly with the water quench, although I don't think it will be uh, too big of an interference and you'll have to just uh, take a little bit of care in placing your quench nozzles so they can quench uh, through the induction coil that's placed around the sample. Uh, next Thanks, slide. Brian. Uh, yeah, the next slide uh, talks about the Lumet. Uh, there's a couple of specific questions. Um, but Brian, if you could know, take kind of 30 seconds and describe what the Lumet is for people who may not be familiar with it. Okay, most people probably know what the Lumet is, but uh, for those of you that don't, uh, the Lumet is a uh, it's a laser ultrasonic metallurgy system. So Lumet is an acronym for laser ultrasonic metallurgy that can be attached to the Glebal system, and it can use laser ultrasonic uh, uh, frequencies and laser and measure the echo pulses to, to get some very good information on the material. So if you go to the next slide, Dan. So very briefly, the way it works is uh, the system uses two lasers. Uh, it uses one here illustrated by the red arrow. Uh, we call it an ablation laser or an impact laser. And basically, it's a very high energy pulsed laser that impacts the surface of the sample and creates a shock wave in the material. That shock wave travels through the sample, bounces off the back surface of the sample, and comes back to the front, where that surface displacement from the shock wave is then measured by a second laser that's a laser interferometer. So what we can get out of this is the essentially the echoes as that uh, sound wave bounces back and forth through the sample. So there are two pieces of information that are available from that sound wave. One is the time between the echoes. The time between the echoes is correlated directly to the speed of sound uh, in the material at that temperature. So the speed of sound in a material is directly related to the bulk modulus of the material. So there's a lot of information that we can get from this. Uh, we get that bulk modulus. We can also see any phase transformations that happen in a material because obviously a, a, you know, a, an austenite grain is going to have a different speed of sound than a ferrite grain. And we can also even get some texture information because depending on the, uh, the alignment of the crystals, you know, a 111 crystal direction is going to have a different speed of sound than a, than a 001 crystal direction. So we can get some information on the, the crystallographic orientation of the bulk sample. The second thing that we can get is this, uh, we call it the decay curve or the energy lost from echo to echo. And it turns out that this energy lost is directly related to the grain size of the material because much of that energy loss is actually caused by diffraction of the of the, uh, the the sound pulse by grain boundaries. So that is directly related to the number of grain boundaries that the pulse crosses, which of course can be used to calculate a grain size. So if you can go to the next sample, Dan. Uh, so uh, I think I uh, 
maybe missed a couple of questions. So uh, uh, back to the last, sorry, back to the last slide. So uh, one of the questions was what kind of samples are, are, are used for the LUMET? We definitely prefer flat samples because as I just described how the, how the LUMET works, we rely on that echo pulse bouncing back and forth. So a flat sample is much easier than a, than a round sample because round sample, obviously those, uh, those sound waves will bounce back off the curve, the walls of the round sample, and you'll get a, a, a much more difficult to analyze echo. We can analyze round samples. It is possible. But if you have the, uh, the ability to do round or flat, flat is, is a little bit easier for the analysis part. Uh, the other only, only other limitation really is the thickness of the sample. Uh, since we're measuring the time between pulses, we need a thick enough sample to basically make that, that time in microseconds measurable. So, you know, one or two millimeters is kind of the, the low end, depending on the material. And then we can't have a sample that's so thick that we lose so much sound energy as that echo goes back and forth that we don't get, you know, a good three or four echo envelope to uh, to get that decay curve. So those are really the only the only limitations that are that are necessary. Uh, the Lumet is often used to get hot grain size in material in real time. Uh, one of the questions is, is it calibrated per material or per metal, and is there a library? And the answer to that is yes, uh, it is calibrated per metal, and it is actually fairly insensitive to, to small amounts of alloying elements in any given metal. So, for instance, this graph shows a series of low-carbon steels that are listed there on the right, and it uh, shows the correlation of grain size versus ultrasonic attenuation for all those different low carbon steels and you can see that they all essentially fall on the same the same curve now the same would be true for for you know aluminum alloys or titanium alloys they would also fall on the similar curve because the 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 primary uh, element is essentially the same in those with smaller additions of alloying elements something like a stainless steel would probably have a different curve uh, there are some uh, available information out there, primarily down at the University of British Columbia for these calibration curves, but I, I would say that I can't just tell you that there's a, a readily available calibration curve for every material out there. Uh, next question in is talks about the non-conductive materials. So the question is, can we test non-conductive materials in a Glebal? Uh, obviously, we can do any of the uh, compression and tension on non-conductive materials in a Glebal. But the, you know, since most people use the Glebal for hot working, uh, the question is, is at right at the moment right now we're working on some beta projects. I think there's nothing right now that's available off the shelf, but I think very soon we'll be introducing some. Uh, different non-conductive heating options. Uh, I show here just a couple of, of, of beta prototypes. So these are these are, are, are very preliminary prototypes, so don't necessarily expect the final product to look like this. But uh, we're looking at two different ways of doing this. This first one shows a, uh, a graphite susceptor inside the induction heating system. So what we have here is a graphite tube that's surrounded by a ceramic tube that is just placed inside the induction heater inside a Glebal. So we can put a sample through the center of this tube, and essentially we can use this uh, inductive susceptor heating the graphite inductively, which then in turn heats the non-conductive sample, and then we can we can do a tension or compression test on that sample. Uh, next slide down. The second prototype that we're looking at here actually uses a conductive metal tube. Uh, it's a similar concept to the induction concept I just shown, but instead of an inductively heated graphite tube, we're using a resistively heated metal tube and essentially just creating a tube furnace inside the Glebal using the Glebal existing power system to heat the tube furnace. And then that tube furnace heats your non-conductive sample for further testing. So uh, we expect one, probably both of these options to be available in the, in the near future. And if you're interested in uh, in working with us on a beta prototype, we'd be happy to, to talk to you. So just uh, contact DSI and, and we'll get that conversation started. Great. Brian, we're going to switch gears. The next question has to do with torsion. Uh, I'm sorry. It's uh, still centering and then we'll go into torsion. Okay, the next question is powder consolidation and centering using a Glebal. And, and we've got this question quite a bit. We did develop a, a prototype. I would say this is still a bit in the prototype stage, but a, a, a prototype powder consolidation system in the Glebal. So we have a couple samples here, a couple slides, excuse me, that show that. So uh, essentially what we've done is we've we've created a, 
powder consolidation tube, which has a, a graphite or ceramic liner that is encased in a high strength steel sleeve. And then by just using two end plungers, we can put the loose powder or the, the green uh, compact inside that tube, place that inside the Glebel and use the Glebel mechanical system to compress from both ends using two plungers. So uh, it kind of shows a, a schematic on top and then it shows a, a uh, photograph of the, the setup outside the Glebel and then installed the Glebel. So uh, this does work. We've done quite a bit of work on this. We've sold this to a few customers. I will say that it's, uh, you know, it does require a little setup and it's uh, you know not the, the fastest test in the world, but uh, we can pass the current either through the powder if the powder itself is conductive, or if the powder is not conductive, we can use a graphite liner, and the graphite liner becomes the the heating element that conducts the current around the powder, and which the powder then then heats up. And then you can set the pressure by by using the compressive force uh, off from the Glebel load cell to put a, uh, a compacting pressure on the sample if you would like. Next slide, Dan. So this shows a uh, just a photograph of the of the system setup. So this is a uh, I believe this is a tungsten carbide powder that we were trying to center here. But uh, we have taken this setup up to about 1400 C for uh, you know normal centering times. So it's a, a fairly capable system. But as I said, it is a, a little bit of a of a uh, it takes a few minutes to to load the powder and, and load the sample into the Glebe. All right, now we're switching gears into the torsion test here. So we had a question about the temperature gradient on a sample during the torsion test. So the torsion unit, as, as most of you are familiar with, uses typically a reduced center section or a, a dog bone type sample. Uh, since we're rotating one end of the sample and holding one end fixed, what we usually do is affix a thermocouple to the non-rotating end of the sample. We do this because if you affix the thermocouple to the center of the sample, as is typically done with Glebel uh, work, or to the rotating end of the sample, the speed of the rotation can often make the thermocouple come off. So the, the inertia of the, of the wire can often just uh, shear the, the weld during a, a fast speed test. Uh, alternatively, if you do not do a a, such a fast test that the thermocouple shears off, the wire around the center specimen or the or the uh, thermocouple on the rotating end will will wrap around the specimen, which which may or not may or may not be a problem. So typically we just use one thermocouple on the non-rotating end. Now if you are actually worried about the thermal gradient, you can put two or three thermocouples on the torsion sample. That's not a problem. You may lose one of them during the test. I would say if you run into problems uh, being able to keep your thermocouples on the center or the rotating end of a torsion sample, you can always just instrument your sample with three thermocouples or four thermocouples and run the thermal portion of your test without the rotation. Since there's not really a lot of geometry change in the torsion specimen during the uh, the torque, you can uh, just do the thermal part of your sample without the mechanical part and you can you can see how that thermal gradient sets up and if the thermal gradient is going to be a problem for you and if you need to to do anything differently to to make sure that you don't have a thermal gradient issue in your sample. Great, thanks Brian. Uh, switching topics, we did have a number of questions and we always get these questions, these are popular questions about thermocouples. So questions like what thermocouples can I use, which one should I use for this particular material, uh, should, which one should I use at a particular temperature range? And then uh, we also hear a lot of uh, different people that are having difficulty welding a particular type of thermocouple with a particular material. Uh, we really can't go through each of those, uh, but what we can do is, is kind of provide some uh, recommended reading. So that a application note, APN 026, uh, does describe some uh, techniques and really gets into some good detail about how to attach thermocouples. Uh, application notes for those of you that don't have them. If you have a Glebel, uh, you have those already, but they are also available on our website. You can go uh, to that resources tab and, and download them there. Uh, also, if you have, uh, for existing customers, if you have a machine, you have the thermocouple welder user manual. Uh, that is very helpful as well. Uh, but in that APN 026, that application note, uh, there are a couple of methods that are referenced. And actually, I'm hoping that David Jacon, who I believe is uh, on the call. Uh, Jake, do you mind just describing briefly uh, a couple of these methods that uh, I know you've used in the past? 
Nope. Good morning. Good afternoon. You can you hear me okay, Dan? Yep. Okay. So we do have a, a couple application notes that we'll cover um, as Dan talked about, just a standard uh, thermocouple attachment techniques. We also have a couple application notes that cover um, a painting technique. This was developed a while ago when we were doing some work with copper. So that is a technique where we'll actually drill a hole in uh, into the sample and uh, lay the thermocouples, twist the thermocouples and put them into the hole and then use a, a device, a painting device to crimp around the uh, sample or crimp around the hole so we can get the thermocouples attached. Um, obviously this isn't going to be the best application for some people if they don't want you know any uh, any holes or anything into the sample. So there is another technique um, where we'll physically wrap thermocouples around the sample. Um, this was done a while ago too, and we do have an application note on that if you're interested. This is where we will cross wire weld or weld together the points of the thermocouple. We'll then put the thermocouple, and this is typically a, a round bar sample, um, around the sample. Uh, one wire comes up each side of the sample. Then we'll use a piece of uh, ceramic tubing to hold those together and kind of bring that bottom point up to contact the sample um, to measure the uh, temperature. Great. Thanks, Jake. Yep. Okay. And then uh, something you should also note is, and, and this comes into play a lot when people are having difficulty or for some reason they, they can't use thermocouples. So we do have pyrometers. I will say also that we've upgraded our, our pyrometers in the past maybe five years, where if you use a pyrometer 10 years ago with the Gleebel uh, versus now, it's much easier now. Uh, the systems have gotten better. We use typically use two-color pyrometers, but uh, we use them if, again, you want non-contact. So if you're going to very high temperatures, uh, difficult to weld materials, uh, or unique sample geometry, so you just can't get a thermocouple where you need it, uh, and also in times where... Uh, people might want to use you know, surface finish is really important where you don't want that weld to interfere, say with a, you know, a wear test that, that might follow the global testing. So uh, pyrometers are a, a very nice feature to use or application to use. Uh, so I'd recommend if you, if you have an older system, an older pyrometer, I uh, reach out to Jake uh, and his team uh, and they can find the, the right pyrometer for the temperature range that you're looking at. We've had a number of couple of questions here, and I'm hoping that maybe Jake uh, and Brian are able to uh, to, to, to discuss these. Uh, but looking at uh, some of these, you know, is there a way to kind of tweak your thermocouples? Uh, looking at, you know, if you're using a thermocouple at lower temperatures, uh, maybe is outside the, the the ideal range. Uh, what you can do there, and also maybe how you'd address uh, noisy temperature data. Brian, I'll, I'll hand it off to you first, if that's okay. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at this, and then if Jake has any further comments. So, you know, one of the one of the, I guess, trade-offs when you're working with uh, with thermocouples is that each each type of thermocouple or each thermocouple pair has a different uh, you know voltage output for temperature difference. So, uh, as you go to higher temperatures, you're pushed into the platinum type thermocouples. Unfortunately, they have a a lower output than the, the type K thermocouples do. but uh, uh, And they're really designed to measure at higher temperatures more than lower temperatures. So they have a, a much lower output at low temperatures, which does make it a little more difficult to uh, to measure low temperatures with uh, some of those, those uh, thermocouples. So that might be one of the issues. Uh, ways to make it more uniform is you can actually heat up through the, the low temperature regimes using either a power angle control uh, or a, a different type of control other than a temperature control. And then once you get to a, a more stable temperature regime, you can switch over to, to using the normal temperature control. Uh, another thing you can look at doing is just uh, adjusting your tap setting on the on the, uh, the Gleeble uh, transformer. So we always recommend that you use the lowest tap setting that gives you the response that you need. Uh, if you're using the highest tap setting on the Gleeble, you're, you're have a lot of power available to heat the sample and of course you know you get in a switch situation we we sometimes use an analogy it's kind of like driving a thumbtack with a sledgehammer so if you can uh, if you only need a, a small hammer to drive a small tack then you're going to be much more controllable with that small hammer so I would I would use the uh, the 
you know, the smallest tap setting you can use. And then look at what your maximum temperature is and, and use a thermocouple that gives you the, the best output for the max temperature that you need. So typically the K-type is, is, is best. Uh, after that, the R-type. Uh, S-type is is probably got one of the lower outputs, but it does have one of the, the higher temperature ranges. So you may be forced into using one of those higher temperature range thermocouples. And uh, the only final thing I could say is that if you can look at some of your PID settings as well to, to make a little more stable heating. And I think I answered the causes and solutions kind of with that same question. So I don't know, Jake, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I'm going to back you up uh, 100%, Brian. That's exactly it. Um, type R thermocouple at 1,000 degrees outputs 4.8 millivolts. Uh, at 1,000 degrees, the type K is 41 millivolts. Um, so a lot more gain out of type K, which obviously is happier, makes the glue a lot happier when we do our our gain. Um, and no, you're absolutely right. That's that's spot on. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. We get a lot of questions about cooling or, or quenching. So a lot of questions, can the Gleeble do this? Can the Gleeble do that? So I want to spend a minute and just give a general overview of cooling options, the way we can manage cooling rates in the Gleeble. So looking at one of the ways we look at it is free cooling. Uh, as Brian described, you know, how the, the sample loses heat just on its own, losing heat either through, you know, through the, the grips, uh, radiating heat out into the atmosphere. Uh, so that's we kind of call that free cooling. And then there's active cooling where we're actively pulling heat out of the specimen. Uh, and then we also have the system is is built in a way where it, it pours you know, energy into that specimen. Uh, and then there's so we're kind of fighting the cooling versus heating. So we we'll, may call that back heating where we're either allowing the specimen to cool on its own or we're actively cooling it. But then we're also back heating to get the uh, specific cooling rate that we're looking for. But then when you get into quenching, there are a lot of, of options. We have the internal quench where we have a specimen with the ends are hollowed out and we have uh, water or a, a cooling medium goes into, uh, pumped into the end of the specimen and then is pumped out. Uh, and that specimen can be modified so that it can be a tube so we can have you know, some, some plumbing changes change it so that the, the, the coolant is going directly through the specimen and we can get some great cooling rates with that. But then looking at probably the more common uh, quenching method is the external method or spraying. And when you're talking about those quenches, I think most people that use the label are familiar with this, but there's obviously a number of different uh, spray heads that, that we, we use. And sometimes they're very specific to a type of test or a type of you know, mobile conversion unit or test setup. Uh, the catalog does have list a number of those quench heads, spray heads, uh, but they're, you know, using the right one is obviously important for the test. Uh, but you can quench uh, externally with compressed air, bottled gas, you know, typically it's an inert gas, uh, argon is the one we, we use most frequently, uh, and then water or water mist, you know, air and water and compressed air combination. Uh, then we get, we have a question, and in a moment I'll ask Brian to talk about uh, cryo quench as well as proportional quenching, uh, which both offer some, these are both relatively new uh, features that we've introduced in the past couple of years and cryo quench in particular is actually still in beta but we are excited about that so ryan do you mind just giving a, a brief overview so the question here was can you test samples below room temperature uh, and it, the answer is a yes but maybe we can describe that a little bit sure dan so we have had over the years quite a few questions to to do cryogenic temperatures for for different reasons you know some people actually want mechanical properties at cryogenic temperatures uh, probably more often people are looking at uh, materials that may have uh, metastable or retained austenite and they want to look at, at sub-zero cooling or cryogenic quenching in order to transform transform any retained austenite uh, into martensite. Uh, we've had some people doing things like welding pipelines in arctic environments and they want to just make sure that their heat affected zone simulation matches the the actual you know thermal profile of, of welding a pipe at a, you know, minus 20 degrees, minus 40 degrees C. So, so these are the different kind of questions we've asked. So we have developed a, a new cryogenic quench system. Uh, our system does use liquid nitrogen and we can essentially pipe that liquid nitrogen either into an ISO-Q specimen like Dan described earlier, or we can actually spray the liquid nitrogen directly onto the surface uh, of a specimen. Uh, obviously one is a little more controllable than the other, but in both these, uh, setups we can actually use uh, again back heat like like dan talked about to 
to either hit and maintain a specific cryogenic temperature for a certain time uh, or to control the cooling rate uh, of the sample as it uh, cools down from room temperature to cryogenic temperature. So uh, I mentioned we use liquid nitrogen as a coolant. Uh, we sometimes use the actual liquid nitrogen on the sample, but we also have another option in, under development where we use a heat exchanger inside a liquid nitrogen bath, and then we can use just a gas, uh, argon, nitrogen, gas, to cool the sample after that gas itself has been cooled in a bath of liquid nitrogen. And uh, so the pictures on the right just show some of the, the, the pictures of the setup. There's uh, uh, some some uh, cryogenic hosing and tubing and insulated tubes and some other equipment uh, involved, uh, but uh, we can certainly uh, discuss that with you. As Dan said, this is a sort of a beta prototype right now, but uh, we are offering this for sale now with the understanding that it's a, it's a developmental beta prototype, and we'd be happy to talk to you uh, if you have any, any questions about it. Uh, I think, Dan, if you go to the next slide, we have some, some examples of the the cooling. So one of the things I probably should point out about liquid nitrogen, sometimes the inquiries we get about quenching with liquid nitrogen are people that expect a faster cooling rate with liquid nitrogen than they can get with water. Uh, unfortunately, while liquid nitrogen is quite a bit colder than a water quench, it really does not give you a faster quench. It can go to lower temperatures, but liquid nitrogen, one is a, uh, you know, it's not as dense as water. The, the, heat of vaporization of nitrogen is much less than the same volume of water. And the biggest problem with getting fast cooling rates with liquid nitrogen is that it actually has a very, very strong Leidenfrost effect in that the, uh, the liquid itself is very difficult to get into contact with the hot steel because it forms a, a vapor layer uh, over the liquid droplets that essentially insulate the steel from the liquid nitrogen. So you get, before the, the liquid nitrogen touches the, the steel or the titanium or whatever you have, it actually vaporizes and forms a, a, a liquid barrier, or excuse me, a gas barrier. So we don't really get faster cooling with liquid nitrogen, but of course, for those applications you want to get much colder, we can do that. Uh, this shows just a uh, an ISO-Q setup in the Glebal, it shows the cooling rate that we get, and it shows that we can get down to, uh, you know, to minus 170 C using our liquid nitrogen setup, but it does take, uh, you know, several seconds to get there. So again, uh, much, much colder, uh, not necessarily faster, but uh, this is actually just a full quench where we just, uh, just put the liquid nitrogen into the ISO-Q setup. We obviously, as I described earlier, could could stop this process at any any given temperature and, and hold at a temperature of you know minus 40, minus 60, minus 80, if you were interested in properties at those specific temperatures. So next slide, Dan. Uh, the other thing we'll talk about here is a proportional quench. So previously, uh, years ago in the Glebal, we just had a quench and the quench was, was either on or off. It was not a, a controlled quench. And we did control cooling rates by, by backheating or by, by allowing the, the thermal system to, to put power in the sample, kind of opposing the quench and controlled the, the, the temperature of the sample that way. That's not very efficient for a couple of reasons. So several years ago, we introduced the proportional quench system in which we have actually a, a feedback controlled quench valve. So we can adjust the flow of the quench gas to match the, the cooling signal or the, the error signal of the thermal system from the Glebal. So this is a, a graph that maybe not that intuitive to understand, but it just shows the the program temperature of a sample and the actual measured temperature of the sample. And superimposed on that is the uh, the feedback signal to a proportional quench valve. So as we're calling for a lot of cooling in the sample, you can see we have a, a high proportional quench volts DC or a high signal going to the valve, which would open the valve and give a lot of flow. And then as the, the sample cools, as we need to, uh, less or more cooling than the, the thermal system adjusts that proportional quench valve and opens it or closes it depending on if we're uh, asking the machine to give us more or less cooling. So essentially we've just been able to to increase the, the control capability of the Glebal and add controllability to our cooling system that we previously offered on our heating system. Great. Thanks, Brian. And it looks like we've done it again. We got so excited talking about the Glebal that we're probably running a little bit behind schedule. Uh, I'm going to skip the next slide here and jump over into uniaxial compression. Uh, so we do get a lot of questions about uniaxial compression. Uh, so 
in fact, is enough to talk about uh, unixial compression for a whole webinar, which we did do. So I rec have some recommended reading here, uh, recommended viewing. So I do recommend going to see uh, episode three. Uh, that was uh, Eric Dietz and Brian Allen did do a uh, webinar on just dedicated to unixial compression. It was great. Uh, also, there's application note 001, first applica application note, uh, which really does discuss the ISOT anvils. Uh, I did want to make a note here. We talk about flow stress a lot here, and we can use the term flow stress to, de to describe uniaxial compression, something we've just always done here. That terminology isn't really specific enough, uh, so uh, people have commented on that in the past. We know that it, old habits are tough to break, so sometimes you'll hear us refer to flow stress. Uh, we're typically re referring to uniaxial compression testing, uh, right or wrong. So we did have a number of questions on this. We are running a little bit short on time, so we may go through these uh, very briefly. Uh, a lot of questions involved how you manage the temperature gradient across the specimen, manage the temperature in the anvils, and there's ways that you can do that by uh, changing uh, the construction of that uh, the ISOT anvil. Uh, we actually do, we do have uh, Dr. Wayne Chen uh, on, the, on the call here. I'm gonna ask him to speak in a moment. Uh, Wayne was actually one of the people that developed this, I believe, in the 1990s, uh, worked with Hugo Ferguson on, on developing this, so he is certainly an expert on it. And I'm going to jump ahead. What I was hoping we could do is kind of describe some of the, uh, when you're constructing this anvil, you, ha you do have some options, things that you can do to change the uh, resistivity uh, across that, that anvil. Uh, and there are, you know, we have here a couple of different places where you can change that resistivity uh, and Really changing the graphite foils. And there's a couple of specific questions that I'm going to ask Chen to discuss in a moment. So I'm going to jump to that, those questions here. Uh, Wayne, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a couple of questions here. Uh, do I need to place graphite foil between the solid anvil and the copper disc in order to protect the copper disc from damage? Or is graphite exclusively used for resistance management? Uh, yeah, actually the answer is no. You don't have to put a uh, graphite foil between the anvil and the copper disc. And the reason we put a copper disc there is really trying to make a kind of uh, a soft, you know, contact for the anvil because the anvil is expensive. And of course, copper is very conductive. That way that you have a very con good conduct interface between the anvil and the base of the, of the anvil assembly. Um, graphite foil, as yes, as we just say, then just say, you know, it's, it's basically for a, a resistance adjustment. I mean, uh, if you read the application note number one, um, for different alloys, aluminum, nickel base, and steels, you could adjust um, the interface layer uh, resistance by, you know, changing the number of graphite foils. That is the way to make sure the temperature uh, within the sample is uniform. And the reason we can keep the temperature uniform of the spaceman is because you can heat the anvil cap at the same temperature as the, as, as the spaceman. That way the temperature will be uniform. If you put a, a good lubricant between the sample and the anvil, then you basically can get a very uniform deformation at whatever temperature you are deforming. Then that's the question one. Yep, thank you. Uh, question two, uh, this is fairly specific, but for test on aluminum, uh, I believe in the webinar it was said that it is better to use stainless steel base cylinder in the ISO T. Question is, can I also use a tungsten or tungsten carbide cylinders? Uh, what effect will the use of tungsten, tungsten carbide cylinders have compared to stainless steel cylinders? It's, it's a pretty interesting question. Actually, um, um, you could, I, I believe, you could really use either stainless steel or tungsten carbide for aluminum uh, or aluminum alloys. And I do not really, I'm, I'm not really so sure the difference in terms of the uh, electrical resistance or thermal resistance between the stainless steel and the tungsten carbide. But uh, uh, the, after all, this is really uh, the thing that the, you, you should consider because that after that one would affect the temperature uniformly within the sample. But I don't believe there'll be a, there will be very significant differences. Uh, if you want to choose stainless steel, I believe it will be easier because it's, it's just a very relatively uh, uh, economical, more economical than tungsten carbide. So I don't believe there is any issue that they, you use stainless steel as an anvil or anvil base uh, for the aluminum alloys, because after all the, the aluminum, the maximum temperature will be you know, less than 600 degrees C. So you can really use stainless steel uh, to, do, to be as a, an anvil as well, because it's a much cheaper than uh, a tungsten carbide. Okay, 
I think that's that. that should yeah. So there's, there's a number of questions. I'm, I'm going to challenge you, to, Wayne, to, to answer them briefly. I don't know if you're able to do that. Uh, are there any ill effects of using yeah, more I'll layers? Yeah, I, this is true. I mean, um, uh, the, you see, again, we know the resistance is depend on the length and, uh, and then the section of areas uh, and, the, and of the materials, the resistivity, right? So number of that, yeah, well, a little bit affect. And the, but you can test it out yourself, one or two or three, but definitely no more than three, because after all, when you compressed, you know, the distance, change, the length changes, the oh, thickness changes, it doesn't really matter. For the okay. second one, uh, then I'll probably simply just uh, read it over and quickly so sure. save some time yeah uh sometimes you know one size is harder and the other the whole reason is because the resistance is different from one to the other so the only way you can make the decision uh, the, the temperature uniform along thickness is that you make sure the reason on both sides of the ammo are the same so when you assemble one side you have to assemble the other side and the same time that you have to uh, preload the ammos before you do the testing as we uh, stated in our application on one okay so for the uh, next question is um, for high force loading yeah we do have a very high temperature uh, um, uh, high strength ammo caps available uh, even up to you know 1800 c as we have tested so if you have any problem with the high temperature uh, deformation we could help you on that um, the fourth next question is um, max steel on a clip set up for solid ammo uh, you don't have to but I think it helps because if you put in a, in a, in a, in a thermal sleeve to kind of uh, um, uh, um, prevent the heat conduction to the screw or electric current through the screw, that will make your anvil probably uh, um, harder than uh, you know it was. So that way you can keep the temperature uniform if you use a single a piece of the anvil as a um, compression testing. Okay. And ISO T, of course, is really the best for your temperature uh, uniformity control. And the last question is, what is the, no, Dan, get back yep, to the one. There. What is the maximum cooling rate? Well, I think you know, it's, it's always a conflict. When you want to have a uniform temperature, the temperature, the cooling rate will always, you know, uh, um, in the minimum. So I would say, if you really want to keep cool, the maximum temperature you can achieve is like 10 C per second. I have never measured it, but I think you, because our single piece is 20 C per second, so with ISO T, I think 10 C probably is the maximum you can achieve because the, the ISO T ammo is not for high cooling rate. The ISO T ammo is developed for a minimum cooling rate. Okay, Dan? Great, thank you. Uh, we're gonna jump ahead. Uh, we appreciate you uh, answering those questions and, and developing the ISO T anvils as well. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead. Uh, Fulvio Siciliano is available. Uh, we probably will run a couple of minutes late. I hope people can stay with us. Uh, if you need to drop off, we understand. Uh, but there are uh, four or five slides left uh, and Fulvio, a uh, number of questions on recrystallization. So I wanted to bring Fulvio in here um, to address them. Uh, first question was, is it possible to study metadynamic recrystallization using Gleebel tests? Uh, welcome, Fulvio. Oh, thanks, Dan. Uh, yes, uh, by the way, Gleebel is a, well, it's a perfect machine to perform this study. Uh, all we have to do, of course, to stop uh, the uh, the dynamic crystallization that will happen after the critical strain. If you look at the stress strain curve in the in the uh, upper left side, we see the critical strain. So it just have to reach the critical strain, pass a little bit, and then unload. So if you unload, you are in the metadynamic crystallization regime. Uh, well, uh, if you if you do perform a double heat test, so you load again the specimen, you can measure the softening by dynamic crystallization, or uh, by just unloading and cooling fast. Uh, you can measure the grain size and do all the uh, all the investigations that you want. Uh, if you come with a question that okay, I don't know where is my critical strain, so you just have to to plot the derivative of the strain uh, as a function of of the strain as well. So the derivative as a function of the plane strain and uh, and check where is the point of inflection. So this is the critical stress, and then you see the critical strain in the curve. Okay, so uh, you go to the next step. Yep. yep. Yeah. I'll I'm not sure if you want you, if you want to cover all all of them. I have ten questions about repsalization. Uh, why don't you take the ones that you think are are most relevant here? So. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. Okay. So this is a uh, uh, well the basic uh, repsalization uh, questions. So it's about the grain growth. 
uh, well, it mentioned that the heating rate can can uh, generate abnormal green growth. Yes, uh, it can uh, generate abnormal green growth because of the partial dissolution of the precipitates that will allow some of the grains to grow. Uh, but during cooling, it doesn't really matter because the cooling just stops the process. Uh, grain growth is a very slow process, so there is no big deal with the cool. So any cooling rate will not influence the, uh, uh, the transformation. Uh, how to perform dynamic revitalization studies in s cast materials such as ingots, where the very large grain size on the order of the glebal specimen. Uh, so I, I, I don't see any, well, a large grain size after the formation will become, let's say, a polycrystal again. Uh, so uh, even if we test, let's say, a single crystal in a glebo, after one cycle of recrystallization, dynamic or static, it will become a polycrystal. So I don't, do not see any, any limitation to study a single crystals or a very large grain size at the glebo. The next one, then, please. Okay, sure. <clears throat> yeah, uh, carbides in grain boundaries and how it influences the, the recrystallization. Uh, well, it can influence in two ways. If the, if the carbides are small enough, let's say less than one micron, so it usually has a dragging effect, the zener, the zener pinning effect, and will anchor the grain boundary. If not, uh, well, it will just accelerate the recrystallization because, uh, well, the, the cold deformation will need to form extra dislocations around uh, the, the, the carbides if they are rigid. Uh, so if they not dissolve during the recrystallization process, so they will just increase the speed of recrystallization because well it will be preferred nucleation sites. Next one then. Okay. Okay. Uh, TNR parameter and uh, well some some researchers consider 50% recrystallization, some of them 40%. So what would be the the well the the best one? Well the TNR. Uh, is better defined by look in 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 the in the mean flow stress diagram, like the the diagram that I'm I'm showing here. So it's basically when there's a change in slope on the behavior. So we have firstly a, a static and a full softening slope, and then we have a pancaking slope. Uh, well, if it's 50% recrystallization or if it's 40, this is not really relevant uh, in the well in the uh, in the concept of TNR. So TNR is as simple as that: is when when the recrystallization change or, or when the mean flow stress change the behavior. So some group research groups are trying to try to increase the complexity uh, of this uh, of this concept, but it's as simple as that. It's only when the when the, there is a change in slope. So in this way. Uh, if you want to calculate the softening or the recrystallization percentage, well, we can use equations or you can measure that in mechanical testing. Next one, then, please. Great. Thanks, Fulvio. Uh, so, uh, continuous and discontinuous recrystallization. Well, this is a, a, a nomenclature issue. Continuous recrystallization is basically a, a very, uh, very fast recovery that usually happens in high stacking fault energy metals. And uh, well, it's usually the softening is usually higher than 50%. So because the soft, softening is so high, some people say, oh, this is this is recrystallized because when you measure the hardness, the hardness will be very low. But it's actually a recovery process because there is no grain boundary migration. So this is a just continuous recrystallization is just a very fast recovery. And this continuous recrystallization is what was the classic recrystallization concept with migration of grain boundaries and eliminating the dislocations. Uh, so cool. do I have more time then? Well, maybe just we'll kind of combine the last, we'll just talk about additive manufacturing. So we've had questions about how to use the Glebal to study additive manufacturing. And that, yeah, again, yeah, okay. we, we could spend a okay. day discussing that. Uh, maybe just kind of you know list a couple of different types of tests. I know you have a slide for each, you know, each of them. I don't think we'll be able okay. to get into them, but just kind of talk about how you see people using the Glebal to study additive manufacturing. Okay, well, the first, uh, the very obvious one is the simulation of post-deposition heat treatment and homogenization. So this is one uh, one step that can really change the properties of the AM part. Uh, next one. Yeah, also the study of phase transformation on cooling. We, ha we have here tests performing, the cooling tests performing at the Glebo in titanium, aluminum, vanadium alloy. Uh, the very uh, well, the slow and very slow heating rate, uh, cooling rates, 
uh, were controlled by the Glebo. And then we have helium quench at 100 Kelvin per second and water quench, uh, water quench at uh, uh, 6,800 Kelvin per second. So we have all the different phases. This is another point that can be studied at the Glebo with AM materials. Next one there. Uh, well, it's a very important one. We can study the thermal cycles during uh, the deposition passes. So we see here that well, the temperature, how it cycles along the process with time. And also, uh, it was measured by this researcher, uh, well, uh, a fraction of alpha phase, that is the low temperature phase, and we see how it goes against the increase of the temperature. So every time we increase the temperature in, in a deposition cycle, we get rid of the uh, part or total of the alpha phase and go straight to beta, beta phase. So beta phase is BCC and alpha phase is uh, hexagonal cross packed. So, and then you can follow uh, you can follow the simulation. And another very obvious uh, way is to test uh, the finalized parts and materials produced by additive manufacturing. So performing mechanical tests, we have here examples of Inconel 718. Yes, uh, I have just one more then, if you allow. Sure. Yeah, so this is a, a well, it's a, a difference between in the axial plane strain, torsion, and rolling. So a lot of people use the, the, the three, uh, tests, but I just put this table to compare uh, basically torsion and plane strain with rolling because the three of them are plane strain compression, uh, the three of them are pure shear, uh, being torsion as a simple shear, and rolling and plane strain is pure shear. Uh, so uh, of course we have, due to geometrical reasons, uh, we have rolling and plane strain activating the same slip systems and producing this uh, very close texture. So the differences are secondary of my primary importance. And one of the big advantages of the torsion is it can absorb high, very high strains and it can, you can actually uh, simulate the, uh, both uh, roughing and, uh, and finishing in the, with the same specimen. Usually, probably you cannot do that with plain strain compression. So the next one there, that's my last one. Okay. Uh, yeah. So here is a, a comparison between plane strain and torsion. I may add uniaxial compression in the future if I have a chance uh, to test. But it, usually what we see is that in, in for a higher strains, plane strain tends to give, let's say, higher stresses. And this is mostly because of uh, a little bit of friction. And uh, part of, of, of this uh, effect is because of the non-uniform or uh, uh, strain gradients in the specimen that are very strong. So then this is my last question. I, I will not have time for demonstration of pasta making today. So uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Fulvio. Uh, so I do want to thank everyone for, uh, our panelists certainly for, for presenting. Uh, thank everybody else for, for joining. Uh, here's the question. Uh, I'll admit no one actually asked this question, but maybe someone should have. Uh, we do have some desktop images that are available. Uh, there's, you can download that zip file, uh, that address down there. I'll include that link. Uh, in the thank you email that you should automatically be receiving um, from this webinar. Uh, so it's, it's a zip file, you can download that, and there's about seven or eight uh, images that you can use as a, a desktop. So a little bit of a treat for people. Uh, again, thank everyone for coming today. Uh, I know we, we aren't able to travel. It uh, looks like if you're following the news, we won't be able to travel for a little while. Uh, we'll see how that develops. Uh, but we do offer, uh, we're looking at exploring ways that we can provide training uh, remotely. So if it's something that you are interested in, you think your team would benefit from some training, please let us know. Uh, reach out to Jake, uh, it's jake at gleeble.com uh, or our service team, uh, they can point you in the right direction, uh, get you and or your team trained. Uh, if you have any uh, additional technical questions, again, I'd, I'd ask you to, to sign up for that service portal. Uh, you can create a support, support ticket and they'll be happy to help you. Uh, if you have any questions about how Gleeble can support your research, please email me and I'll connect you with an application expert uh, in your region. Uh, my email address is dan.quigley at gleeble.com. I apologize for going a little bit longer uh, than expected and appreciate our, uh, our panelists. Um, apologize to them for, for rushing a little bit, uh, but thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, please do stay safe and healthy.